Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sherwood Smith, he, him pronouns, and I'm the director for the Center for Cultural Pluralism, and I would like to welcome you to part two of You Can't Be Racist If You Don't Understand Race. This session focuses on multicultural, multiracial issues, with the leading question being that people often ask, what are you? I want to start out with an important recognition. As a land acknowledgement, the university is located on land which has long served as a site and meeting place for exchange of indigenous people for thousands of years. This area has been the home of the Western Abenaki and UVM honors and recognizes these people, especially the Abenaki as traditional stewards of the land, water on which we are gathered today in person or virtually. And in that spirit, we want to begin by acknowledging that we're guests in this land and we need to respect, honor and protect the land within our use. And in offering this land acknowledgement, I and UVM want to affirm, affirm Indigenous people's sovereignty, history and experiences. So thank you. This session. This session will have a closing opportunity for feedback. And I want to give you a little background on myself in this session, and then I have the honor of introducing my co-presenter. So these sessions grew out of earlier work by the Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Dr. Wanda Heading Grants, work with amazing grace and beyond experience. And we at the center felt it was important to expand that work and focus specifically on issues of race. I encourage you, you can go back and go to our website and find links to the amazing grace series beyond experience and also to our first sessions if you wish. And as I said, my name is Sherwood Smith. I use he, him pronouns, I'm director for the Center for Cultural Pluralism. And I want to have the pleasure of letting you meet my colleague and cohort in this process, uh, Dr. Nikki Kana. So Nikki, to you. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Nikki Kana. I am an associate professor of sociology. I've been at UVM since uh, 2007, I believe, and I am very excited to be here today. My research and um, my teaching primarily centers of, around race relations and racial identity. And my research recently has looked at colorism among Asian Americans, so skin color discrimination, uh, but also biracial and multiracial identity. I have a book that came out in 2011 called Biracial in America. And um, I, I think that's that's about it. So I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Nikki. You remind me that I should say I, I came here in 95 as a postdoc and like Nikki teach also teach in the College of Ed and Social Services. Nikki's in the College of Agricultural Life Sciences. Nikki and I started this out with a joint conversation, which I hope many of you have watched and sort of talked about our understandings and experiences. And it led me to think back on what we did, Nikki. And I'm wondering, you know, given the nature of this talk and we're looking at multiracial identity and both our both of us have sort of thought about that. How do you handle the question of your identity when either people ask or when you're asked, how do you, how do you think about your identity? Let me phrase it that way, given this topic. Yeah, so I think the way I've thought about my identity has certainly changed over my lifetime. Um, when I was really young, I think when people asked me about my identity, I would say things like I'm half Indian and half American. So I really talked about nationality um, and also actually quite interesting because I think whenever I was young, I uh, when I said half American, I was sort of implying whiteness as well. Um, and I think that's something important to think about. Um, now I would say I'm mixed. I, I tend to not use the term racial or multiracial or biracial, um, just primarily because race is a social construct. I'm not morally opposed to any of those. 
those um, labels, but I tend to just say I'm mixed. And really when I say that, I'm, I'm sort of referring to um, my mixed cultural background and the fact that my parents are from different parts of the world. So my father's from India and my mother is white and American. Um, but also I think over my lifetime, my affinity towards each of those groups has changed. Um, you know, feeling closer to one group or over another, depending upon my age and context. So there's been a lot of fluidity in that as well. And so I'll ask you too, Sherwood, how have you thought about your identity when, when people have asked that question? Well, you said it well. I can, you know, I think my progression is sort of from um, Afro-American to Black to African-American and trying to make up my mind about which of those labels makes the most sense. Heavily conflicted because I spent time in Africa and it made it clear to me that nobody's African except in the US, right? You talked about nationality. So in in Kenya, people are Kenyan and Tanzania, people are Tanzanian or they refer to their ethnic groups, their, their tribal affiliations. Nobody says they're African. And in my own family, you know, is the history and at least I've found in my African-American community, most of the history is oral. And so in my own family background, there's talk about my great great grandmother being a marrying a Pennsylvania Dutch Quaker man that some of our family that came up from Georgia had Cherokee in the background and some of our family who came down from Massachusetts had Iroquois. But unlike you, I don't really have any of the cultural traditions connected to those identities, the language, the food or any of those pieces. So I can acknowledge it, but really I don't have a practice connected to it. So I tend to name myself as either black or African-American. Either of those terms are OK for me, but understanding that. You know, my own background is not. For lack of a better word. Um, you know, homogeneous, it's not pure by any stretch of the imagination and that there's a mixture in my own background and. Acknowledging that, but not having a really clear connection to it in the way someone who had parents from those two backgrounds together might have. Yeah, it also just makes me think of as well um, finding out new parts about my background. That you know, we have family members that are um, most likely uh, originated in the Middle East as well, and so it sort of complicates the way I think about. Um, myself and my own family as well. Um, even on my dad's side, who is from India, um, he very likely has some degree of your, you know, recent European ancestry somewhere in his family line. So it all is very complicated, and I think that's also why I don't necessarily say something like biracial, um, but sort of mix. And mix can mean a lot of different things, and you know, include a lot of different backgrounds, just just like your own as well. Yeah, this piece of sort of always discovering yourself, I think, is one of the pieces if you start to acknowledge that you do have, you know, multiple parts to your background. Speaking of, you know, we just finished the 2020 census and every year the census categories sort of shift a little bit. What do you think is going to happen over time? Do you think there'll be a greater reliance on more categories or do you think we're moving towards eliminating some of them how do you what's your feeling in terms of the way our country is going in dealing with you know it used to be pick one and now they at least are acknowledging that people have the rights and needs to pick multiple categories what's your senses about where that might go yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. It's really interesting because I usually share with my students, as I know you do, the, the change every 10 years. You know, we've taken a census, I believe, since 1790, and every 10 years those categories change, and sometimes they've changed pretty substantially. I think that that we might see some um, additions of categories, but, you know, who's to say? I was actually surprised for this year for the 2020 census that we didn't see the uh, the addition of what some people have called the MENA category, which is M-E-N-A, uh, Middle Eastern, North African. I know that some of those groups, those identity groups, have um, argued that there needed to be some sort of classification that better or best captured their experiences in the US. So they're currently classified as white, which for many of my students that can be surprising, if especially if they're not from those particular um, ancestries or, or ethnic groups. 
Um, certainly we would say someone from North Africa or the Middle East probably is not having the same type of experience or lived experience in the United States as, as someone who's European American. So we might see some change in the future with regard to that. Um, it's really hard to say. I know that the biggest change I have seen in my lifetime that has directly affected me is, is what you had mentioned before was uh, what had happened in 2000. So prior to 2000, everybody had to choose one box. And um, as of 2000, uh, people with multiple racial backgrounds have been able to choose as many boxes as they wanted to choose that they felt, um, you know, represented their ethnic or racial identity. So I think that was a big change um, and move forward. I think prior to that, many people chose this other category, which is sort of like this catch all category where, you know, people who don't find their particular racial group on that list might check, but that's really this large ambiguous category. Um, what do you think you might see in the future, Sherwood, in terms of changes to the to the census? You know, I think the challenge is that, and we're seeing it this year in terms of the numbers have to do with access to resources. And so I think that the powers of the system that was created for many of us, not by most of us, leads to an, a false need for competition. Because I I would love to see a place where people just get to write in, right, whatever they choose, and then people can, you know, well, preferably now type in so you could read their handwriting, but I think that would be the place that I would be most excited to see it go. I think there'll continue to be this growing of the census as groups feel the need both for their own recognition and because the system is set up on resource allocation, the need to be represented so that they have access to those resources because they're often based on numbers, unfortunately. Um, so I'm, I think it's going to continue to expand in terms of what's there rather than allow for people to just name themselves is what I suspect will happen. That makes me wonder though, and we talked about this a little at the at the beginning, there's this distinction between my ability to name myself, how I see myself, and how others might view me, right? And so I can say I've got Pennsylvania Dutch Quaker, and I could say I'm part Quaker, but that's not gonna get me very far in a public context because people aren't gonna see me that way. I wonder, have you seen or from your research, do you feel like that's changed at all or is it still really heavily weighted towards how people are read versus how they read themselves? I definitely think that there is still a measure of constraint that I know people in my studies have talked about where there's certainly been more um, flexibility in terms of identifying as multiracial or biracial, but still they talk about this sort of pressure from others to still be put into a particular box. Um, to some degree, there's that openness, okay, you're biracial or multiracial, um, or, you know, others sort of try to put them into a, a box that they're black or they're white or, or whatever it might be. So I, I think that that certainly still exists. And I think part of that has to do with physical appearance. So I know in, in, in my situation, I can identify as mixed or mixed race, so to say, or multiracial. I can very easily identify as white because I present outwardly. I mean, that's sort of how people perceive me as a, as a white woman. So that would be a, certainly a choice that's available to me. Um, I think that if I were to say I was Asian or Indian, then I would certainly experience some pushback, even from some within my own, you know, Indian community as well. And I think physical appearance has a big part of that. I think if I had that more phenotypic Indian ancestry, I'd probably have a harder time identifying as white, uh, and it would be easier for me to identify as Indian. So I do think phenotype is a big part of that. And um, one of the examples you mentioned in our first session um, that I oftentimes talk about with my students is Barack Obama. Barack Obama 
you know, when he became president, he was the first black president. He was the first African-American president. And people acknowledged that he had a biracial background and he could identify to that to some degree if he wanted to, but he certainly couldn't identify as white. And so to say he was a white president, there would have absolutely been a lot of pushback. And I do remember reading an article um, when he was either running for his first term or maybe when he when he won his first term where uh, in, in an op-ed somebody had written, why doesn't he just identify as, as white? He's just as white as he is black. And it made me laugh because I thought, well, go ahead and let's see how that's going to go. Because we do, you know, we do tie so much um, race to physical appearance today in this country that he would have had a very difficult time um, identifying as white. And I would imagine most of the country would have had something to say about it. Um, so th that that constraint still absolutely exists, even though he was raised by, you know, his his white grandparents and his white mother. And, you know, uh, even though he has these ties to that part of his family, I think he would still, you know, have been constrained to identify that way. No, I totally agree. I mean, Tiger Woods is another one where it's sort of Thailand claimed Tiger and everyone in the U.S. is like, yeah, well, but, <laughs> you know, what do people <laughs> see? The other side of this, and I've I've been puzzled about it, is there's been a real interest in Ancestry.com and all of these tests which sort of give, and, you know, I keep thinking about whether I'm going to pay pay good money to have them tell me where I'm from or not. But again, it sort of begs the question of what does that mean if you haven't had the experience? So if I discover that there's some particular, I don't know, I'm one quarter Greek. Well, that's interesting, but I don't have any cultural, ethnic, uh, linguistic connection with that. It's, it's interesting information. Um, so I've really wondered how authentic these sort of and how useful, let's not say authentic, how useful these ancestry pieces are in some ways. I'm wondering if that's been a topic that's come up for you with your teaching and um, or what your response is to it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think because one of the things I teach about is that race isn't biological. One of the things that students oftentimes want to ask me about is, well, how come we have these these DNA tests, right? And it's telling me the different, you know, that you're you're five percent this and ten percent that. And I try to remind students that really it's just showing you what populations you you share some commonalities with with regard to DNA. And really, what they're talking about is recent ancestral backgrounds and recent meaning maybe in the last 500 years. Um, I, I like to remind students that humans have common origins and those common origins are probably in Eastern Africa. So, you know, if we really had a DNA test that said where we all came from, it should all end up in the same place, right? They should all look pretty similar. So I try to remind them, this is just telling us where maybe some of our ancestors lived at some point in, in their recent ancestral lines. So one really good example is my dad did his, um, his DNA on Ancestry.com or something similar, and he saw that he had some small percentage of Scandinavian, probably from the area of Sweden. And it's interesting, right? I mean, it's very interesting. But again, sort of, you know, it's probably not really useful for him other than to say then I've got, you know, something, you know, other than maybe Middle Eastern Indian. But really, you know, one thing I, I had this conversation with my father is you probably have ancestry from a lot of parts of the world. This is just the most recent, but our ancestors are probably migrated around Africa, out of Africa, through Europe, through Asia. So, you know, I want people to remember to take those tests with a grain of salt. They're certainly really interesting, but you have ancestors from all over the world that have migrated and traveled all over the world. So, you know, that I think that's, you know, one thing I would say, it's very interesting. It's probably not that useful. What do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on this, Sherwood? I think we're all looking for an understanding of who we are and it's one of those tools. I just think that using it as proxy for your lived experience isn't really helpful. Oh, I see we have some questions from the audience. Great. Um, here's the first question. Does it make sense to put race on the census at all? 
Does that keep that idea of race? That the idea does that keep the idea that race is more than a social construct? You want to start if you would? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a great question. And when I share with students how much race is socially constructed and you know how these categories have changed every 10 years on our census, I think they more and more see how these categories seem absolutely ridiculous. However, and, and one of the things they'll say is, why do we keep counting it on the census? It's sort of reifying this idea in our mind. It's, you know, we are claiming these identities and really it's separating us from each other. But I, I, I remind students that there's a purpose for counting um, race on the census, for asking people about their racial backgrounds. It's a way for us to, um, one, as you mentioned, allocate funds for different groups, especially marginalized groups or groups that have been heavily discriminated against. But it also helps us monitor discrimination. So if I can look at the census and see that um, a particular racial group is less likely to own their own home or a particular racial group is is um, much lower in terms of socioeconomic status, whether it's by looking at their educational level or their income level, that's telling me something. And so uh, we're better able to monitor discrimination. So if we took those those categories out of the census, I mean, at first it sounds kind of nice, right? We're just Americans. We're not black. We're not white. We're not Asian. It's sort of like this lofty ideal that maybe if we we remove these questions from the census, we'll just stop thinking of each other in racial terms. But the reality is race still exists, discrimination still exists. And by having those categories on the census, we're better able to monitor civil rights laws. We're better able to monitor discrimination and see sort of how much it is happening or how much racial inequality still is um, a reality in American society. So they're still very important. Um, whether we'll ever get to a point where these categories are not necessary. I don't know if that will ever happen. So it, they are important, as at least for now. I'll turn it back over to you. I would agree with everything you said because I think the danger of removing the categories in the current climate of the U.S. is moving to a colorblind state where, well, if the categories aren't there, then I don't have to attend to the racial inequalities. And I don't know that we're at a place where we could attend to those inequalities without these components and the same you know there's that wonderful study where they were doing music uh, orchestra checks and only the men were getting positions until they put a screen up and then they discovered that the people the men who were reviewing the performers heard the heels and made the assumption that they were women and still rated them so they had to have everybody walk out barefoot i think there's so many layers beyond just the category that would have to be removed to get people to a place where they really weren't using racial constructs in their own thinking, consciously or unconsciously, that for the moment they're still important. There's another question here in the chat. Somebody said, I really like the YouTube video that YouTube provided and the images, i.e. the image of the fraternal twins to emphasize the differences in physical characteristics combined with almost no genetic variation. I'd love to hear your opinion on how to how do we have these types of conversations with people that lean away from science for back of a better phrasing? Hmm. I'll try and pa then pass it to you. Is that OK? That sounds good. So I think, and Nikki mentioned this, um, I'm a zoologist in early early life. We're primates and we're visual primates more than anything else. And so I think when you say people, maybe if I understand your question well, when you say people are leaning away from science, they're leaning more on what they see. And this is the challenge, I think, going back to the earlier question about why don't we just get rid of race because if it's a social construction. Social constructions have meaning because we give them power. There's a fancy academic word called reification that we it may, it's around so long that it gives it meaning, right? People, we talk about Bix. We don't even have to say pen because we're so familiar with Bix being a pen maker. So I think the way you have a conversation with people that aren't talking about science is to begin to explore, well, what are the traits you're using as markers? So if you're saying skin color is your marker for race, 
let's go around the equator and show you all the people who have really dark skin from very different regions of the world. Or if you're using hair texture or eye shape, you know, so I think one of the ways to sort of engage people is if this is the criteria, yes, there are people who will fit it, but there are also people from other regions of the world that will also still fit those those categories. So what is it you're trying to do by using those categories? What's your purpose in creating these subgroups of people? Is perhaps an important conversation, I think, to have with people that are stepping away from science. Science certainly isn't the answer to everything. So that's my two cents. Nikki, to you. Yeah, I mean, I think I would, I would absolutely agree with that. I think that, um, well, from my own experience, I've had conversations with people where um, I will talk about or bring up science as a way of dispelling the, the myth of race as, as biological. And I've had people laugh. Like, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with someone, and I, I certainly won't name names, but, you know, having a conversation with someone saying, you know, uh, according to what we know in terms of fossil evidence and, and, and DNA, that likely all, all people began in Africa. And there's some debate about where exactly in Africa, but I've had people laugh at that. Like, that's that's not true. Like, that's crazy. And, and just believe science must be wrong or there's some sort of agenda behind the science. And obviously we see those similar arguments in, in, other, in other avenues with regard to science. Um, I still like, I feel like I'm just still persistent and I, I, I still sort of fall back on science um, in many of my arguments. So, okay, yes, you don't, maybe you don't believe this, but let me talk about what we know about DNA, that we are, we are so genetically similar, that yes, there are some differences between me and someone else who maybe is more recently has African ancestry, but those differences really aren't um, substantial. And, and I know that one thing we, we talked about last time is, you know, Sherwood, you and I may have a lot more genetically in common with, than with other people who look very similar to us. And I try to remind people that I think that um, sometimes I do feel like I might be banging my head against a, a wall if someone really wants to, um, you know, deny the science behind it. But I understand that as well. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things I do teach about is some of the scientific racism that occurred in the 18th and early 19th century where science was used to uh, you know show or you know what they believed was showing that there were somehow these real inherent differences between racial groups and we can look back on that, that now and say that that was incorrect so i i do understand sometimes people's um lack of trust um but I think Sherwood, what you said exactly is is sort of bringing that maybe away from science a bit and talking about what are the things you see because we do associate so much with race with what we see in other people and how they physically look. So talking about what are those commonalities? I mean, in in India, there are people with dark skin who are darker than some people from Africa, and in southern India, they oftentimes have sometimes the same hair texture as people from Africa. So there are so many commonalities, and I think challenging people to think about what are their stereotypes of people who are Asian or black or white, and then you know what what is their eye shape, what is their skin color, what is their hair texture, and actually to realize that the world is much more complicated. And if we walk around the globe, we see these characteristics really very gradually and continuously. And there's a lot of shared characteristics across so-called different racial groups. So, um, but it's tough sometimes. You're challenging people's beliefs about race. And um, uh, I remember listening to a scientist who said, our eyes deceive us. Like people used to believe the world was flat, right? If I look out, and maybe some people still believe that. <laughs> um, but if I look outside my my window, it looks like the world is flat. And so our eyes deceive us. And it's the same with regard to race. We see these very physical cues. And it's hard to move past that when we've been taught our whole lives about race. And this person's this race and this person's that race. So it's, it's a, it can be an uphill battle for some. And I acknowledge that. Thank you, Nikki. There's another question here. Um, does knowing more about your background through something like Ancestry.com improve our understanding of race or does it hinder it? You want to start out or you want me to start? I can actually start with this one. Um, I think in some ways it can be good because we might see that we have 
a lot of different components to our recent ancestry, and you can maybe see how sort of mixed we are. But in some senses, I can think it, you know, I sort of think of it as not a good thing. It kind of reifies this notion that race is biological when we know that's not true. I mean, again, those tests are just really telling you where you have more recent ancestry, what part of the world. It's not telling you what race you are. Race itself is still a social construction. So I might learn that I had some ancestors probably in the region of Ireland, I had some ancestors probably in the region of England, some ancestors probably in the region of what's today Iran and, and North India, for example. Um, and that's really all it's telling me. So I feel like sometimes people look at these and it's sort of reifying this notion of race for them. And I think it complicates that. And I want people to sort of remember when they do this, you're just learning where you might have had some ancestors, what parts of the world, but it's not really telling you your racial breakdown, so to say. That's something we're putting on the tests. Um, it's not something that these tests are telling us or our DNA is not telling us that. And then, uh, you know, what do you what do you think about that, Sherwood, as well? I think you've named the complexity. I think the, the challenge is that I think the tests can be useful if we could separate them from this overarching concept of race. And I'm not sure that that's easy. I don't think we naturally hold multiple conflicting ideas at the same time in our heads well. So for myself, I'm, I'm mixed about my feelings about these tests because it would be fascinating for me to try to figure out because we have no history in my family about what part of Africa I'm from. But I also realized that while that would be really reassuring for me, I'm not sure I can use it to make meaning about anything like say, well, that's why my grandfather was like this, right? Because my great great grandfather was born in the US. So I'm not sure that any of that stuff's carried over, but it would be meaningful for me to be able to say, well, you know, it's more likely we're from Ghana than it is that we're from Togo, or it's more likely we're from the former Zaire than it is we're from the from the Liberian, the former Liberia, right? Um, so I think it's it's not unhelpful if it's not, like you said, seen as an answer to the race question. We have another question here. For people that identify or cling to their white identity, when people are liking this DNA stuff, for people that identify and cling to their white identity, do you think the DNA test shows them that their actual background is, could be what their actual background is? could be helpful to opening the conversation regarding that we humans have more in common instead of what's separating us. Um, I'm simply going to say yes and pass it over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would agree with that. I think that um, these tests can be really, maybe this is certainly an area where they can be useful, especially if you're finding out maybe about some recent ancestry that is pretty surprising and it's not just your European white, for example. Um, I think that you might realize then you do have a lot of common with other groups. Um, maybe if you have indigenous ancestry or black ancestry or Asian ancestry, I think in that sense, you might feel more of a, an affinity or feeling towards groups other than those which you have identified with. And it might sort of, you know, help sort of bring people together a bit. I know I've seen, um, I've seen like video clips where people find out about their racial background, some piece of information that is pretty surprising to them. Maybe they were, uh, there's one in particular I'm thinking of where it was like a, I don't know, white nationalist, or I don't know where, what the word would have been, but they found out they have some black ancestry, you know? And, and I think that that can be really powerful for people um, to learn that information and maybe realize that, okay, you know what? I actually share something in common with um, people that I didn't even realize I shared in common. So I think that that can be powerful and, and potentially useful in that way. I think though, going back to Sherwood, what you said before, you know, you don't necessarily have that lived experience. It's, you know, probably not going to change your entire identity, but, but um, maybe it will help you um, relate to other people in a way you hadn't before. And that I think can be very powerful. I like what you said, and I think that the relation piece could be a really key benefit to this. I also think it destabilizes this idea of whiteness as purity. You know, and the ideal of sort of the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Northern European. 
when in reality, I think if people did their ancestry test, they'd discover that there are very few people who are, you know, purely Germanic or purely Britons, right? Even if they, you know, their family came over from Ireland or Scotland or Welsh, given the number of people who moved through the British Isles, um, that's unlikely. So I think it, it's also a, maybe a unifying factor in people beginning to understand that this idea of to use really intentionally bad English, ain't none of us pure, right? <laughs> yes. Um, there's a comment here that goes back to our earlier discussion. The comment says, um, as an adopted child having very limited knowledge of where my ancestry came from, I found using ancestry was a huge comfort in finally having some idea of my ancestral background. Makes sense. It settled a family claim that there was Native American Greek grandmother on the maternal side of our family, the DNA report indicated that there was no Native American ancestry. So it, it, it did sort of potentially clarify some questions about family history. I would um, just add that there's this other rub to this. Again, that identity is both if in quotes biological and also cultural. And so I have a friend um, from when I was in college. Her mother identified as completely white, was in a relationship with a man who identified as white. She got pregnant. They broke up when he found out she was pregnant. She went on to get into a relationship with a Puerto Rican man, married him. When their daughter was born, she assumed that this was her biological father. He brought her into the Puerto Rican community. She was accepted because this was her dad. And she spent probably the first 18 years of her life identifying largely as a Puerto Rican American. It wasn't until she was in her late teens that her mother told her who her biological father really was. Right? So, Culturally, socially, all of those things. If you did a DNA test on her, nothing's going to show up that says that she's connected to, you know, Puerto Rico or any of the Spanish speaking countries in the world, perhaps. But in terms of the way she was raised and all of her experiences. So I think there's this balance we have to do between sort of nature, the nature of the biology and the nurturing experiences we have growing up. But I do totally support the fact that you know, if you don't know about your background, that the DNA test could be tremendously helpful in, in making some clarity and sense out of that. There's, um, do you have any thoughts or I can move to the next question, Nikki? I would just like to add to, I think that certainly um, we tie race to having a some degree of ancestry. Um, with that particular group or shared recent ancestry with that particular group, but also, as you said, culture. And it just made me think of, um, and this is something we were just talking about in, in one of my classes, but Japanese Brazilians. So there's been a large migration um, at the turn of last, last, last century of, um, of people of Japanese ancestry or people from Japan to Brazil. And um, I remember watching a uh, film about some of the people like the you know kids who grew up there who see themselves as certainly Brazilian uh, they they understand they have Japanese ancestry but also Brazilian is as um, from you know Latin American for example so there's a lot of things we might assume uh, or think about as racial but are heavily cultural as well so um, Japanese Brazilians who maybe have very little ties to their home country of Japan who no longer speak the Japanese language and everything is really immersed within this Brazilian society so um, culture is a big piece of that as well and and sure with the story you shared is is interesting because I actually you know in my personal life have have come across many stories um, of people who learn about their ancestry at an older age who didn't know that they you know weren't all white or for example or you know didn't you know basically finding out new information and I think that that is is very interesting to me um, for people to find out this sort of ancestral connection they have, even if they didn't have the cultural connection. So maybe the opposite of the Japanese Brazilians, so to say. Thank you. 
Um, oh, this is a good question. How do each of you reconcile possibly fitting into multiple identity groups and perhaps not into any specific group at the same time? This is always a tricky one for me as I'm biracial and a multi-ethnic person. Would you start with that one and I'll follow you? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's one of the recurrent themes in my research um, that that many people feel like they're this and that, but they don't necessarily feel a full membership in either of those groups. So it makes me think of um, Kamala Harris right now. And uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, on social media about her being and in the media about her being Asian American and African American, sort of both of those things. But then there's been a lot of challenge and backlash when I look at sort of some of the comments on social media and social media it's its own animal but you know whether she really is African American or whether she really is Indian American because she's not quite fully either of those things so I, I, I definitely think that's a recurrent um, issue and I do think phenotype also still plays into that so probably I'm betting Kamala Harris is more so accepted uh, as African American than she is as Indian American because of the way she outwardly appears. But at the same time, I mean that that's a legitimate issue for a lot of biracial and multiracial people is uh, sort of being able to claim this and that and that maybe, but but not quite fully being a or feeling maybe a full member of of either of those groups or all of those groups. I'll turn it back over to you, Sherwood. Well said, and certainly, you know, in the sense of just speaking from a black perspective of my family, I can remember growing up with my grandfather and older African Americans sitting outside in the yard talking with me there, and they went from, uh, let's see if I can do the categories, coal black, black, mahogany, brown, tan, high yellow, and red bone, because there were black folks with red hair and freckles, who the community owned as black, because in their generation, there was no multi-racial, multi-ethnic per se, but clearly aware that there was a mixture here, but the mixture was contained within the African-American, or in that, those days, black or Negro label, right? So I think at least in my experience of my community of color, they were clear that there was mixture there, but that the option to claim something else really wasn't functional outside the community. That if people saw you as black, you, it didn't really matter what you said, but that the black community acknowledged this difference. And sadly, there was some dis internal pressures, depending on how light or dark you were, to value lightness in some parts of the community over dark skin as well. So. Yeah, it's definitely, um, again, it's this ability to hold conflicting ideas at the same time, which both are true and both aren't, you know, two ideas, both being true and untrue at the same time, all working for or against us sometimes. Another good question here. It says, and I don't know the answer to this. I'll, I'll be fair, Nikki, and I don't know if you do. You talked a bit about the census, but not quite how the categories are picked. Do you know who picks the categories and what methodology they use? Is it topical race issues that are that they are trying to better understand the difference in? I have I, no idea who how the census comes up with these categories. I you want me to jump in? I th I think that it depends on the year. So um you know it's it's historically been white men, um, and I'm sure you know would hope that that's changed over time. But it oftentimes has depended up upon what their goals were. So um, you know these are these are very political categories. There might be a reason for including a particular category. So so one I like to talk about. I believe it was in the 1800s, maybe 1890, where they included categories like mulatto and quadroon, which meant you were a fourth black, or octoroon, which meant you were eighth black. And at that point, they decided to include those categories because they were actually wanting that that information or that data so that scientists could show that these 
people were degenerate, that they were there was something wrong with them. So there, you know, there have been different reasons for creating specific categories. And I will say that I think by about 1920 or maybe it's 1930, um, they decided to throw out those categories altogether and just have, um, you know, there were there were a number of categories, but rather than, you know, mulatto or quadroon or octroon, it was just black. And so, you know, it sort of fit into this notion of the one drop rule that if you had any black ancestry, we're not going to count that as a separate thing. They were all really just seen as types of blackness. So why don't we just say black? So it depends on what the goals were at the time. And, and one of the things I like to say to my students is think about what's the objective of the classifier, because there were specific reasons why some categories were included or excluded. Um, and like I said, with the quadroon octoroon, it was because they were trying to prove something in particular. Um, and, and that would fall out of favor, you know, several decades later. So think about what's the objective of the classifier. I know that there are Native Hawaiians who have tried to get a Native, um, uh, Native American classification for many years because they wanted to have the same sorts of programs um, that were available to indigenous groups on the continent. And for years that's been resisted and the reason I would argue is because the federal government didn't necessarily want to have to extend those same, you know, same types of funding or programs to that particular group. So again, just think about what's the objective of the classifier. But also keep in mind that in recent years, there are many groups lobbying for themselves. So like the MENA category that I mentioned earlier, this has really come out of people of Middle Eastern or North African descent who are saying, hey, like my lived experience isn't as a white person. Why am I being classified that way? Um, and there still hasn't been a change, but maybe there will be some in the future. So there are individual groups that really advocate for themselves for particular categories also. And I'll throw it back to you. I think that that key question is, you know, what are people trying to do, as you said? And the other key question is, who benefits from the way the categories are set up? Right? We That's know who has right. the ability to make them because we know what the representation is in Congress and the Senate and the House. but who's also benefiting from the way those categories are set up or who's marginalized is another big question. Because I think it's multiple to the, to the question, as you put out, some of it's political, some of it's economic, some of it's pressure group. There's a whole bunch of different reasons that I think are playing in there, but who's actually, you know, impact versus intent sort of piece may be a big question there. Um, what have we got next here? How do ethnic identity and national American pride coexist in the United States? Second part of this, how has this changed in your lifetime? What made you more or less passionate about your ethnic background? Hmm. Want me to try? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I'm extremist, I'd say ethnic identity exists in a very limited context in the US. I think it's subsumed with racial identity. You get it a little bit when you hear people talk about being Italian American or Irish American, but you have to also remember that historically those were groups that were considered marginally or not quite white originally because of their ethnic traits. And even in Vermont, the French Canadians sort of hid some of those traits because they were stigmatized or discriminated against for being not as white as the Anglo-Saxon Protestants, right? So I think the ethnic identity piece only recently has been something that's been named and celebrated and historically you are put into a racial category regardless of what you claimed for an ethnic identity. And if that racial category was not assumed to qualify for all the benefits of whiteness, you were marginalized in some ways. Uh, Mexican-Americans went to the Mexican-American War were classified as whites, but they were clearly not given all the rights and privileges because of the way they looked, right? So I think that those things have had a sort of conflicted family relationship, if you want to put ethnicity and pride, because I think one of the challenges is that the ideals that America stands for are ideals I really love and hold dear in terms of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, historically, that has been the way the game worked for so many people. 
And so again, I think it's that conflict. So I think the ideals are there and we continue to strive for them. But I do think that at least for me, you know, in some senses, I don't know about being passionate about black. I didn't have an option to choose not to be black, right? So it wasn't it wasn't a um, a conscious choice as much as and a label that I was immediately put on me that I could there was no not even the consideration that there was some other alternative. As I said, at least in my own family, I was clear that there were mixtures within my background, but they they weren't relevant um, to the lived experience of my family or me growing up or to a large extent today even. I'm going to pass that over to you, Nikki. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with everything you said. I, I There's some really interesting research in sociology, and, and this really was in the 90s, so it's it's I'm not really sure, you know, it's it's dated, but I don't really think that much has changed. And sort of going off what you said, Sherwood, I think that for many groups, they're raced before they, they can claim an ethnic group. So, um, so according to this research, it is that white people in this country, because of their dominant group, they have sort of more flexibility in terms of claiming ethnic identity. So it's like you can be sort of more playful with your identity. I'm Irish, I'm Italian, I'm this and that. But for, for people of color, they can claim those different identities, but oftentimes they're raced as as being Asian. You know, you might say, yes, I'm Chinese or I'm, I'm half Chinese and I'm uh, I've got Chinese ancestry and Korean ancestry and, I, you know, this and that. But really, people will oftentimes say, well, yes, you're Asian or you're black or you're, you know, whatever it might be. So I think that there is less flexibility for people of color. Um, I feel like thinking about my personal experience, um, Yes, I may not be white, but because I outwardly appear white, I think I also have some flexibility and choice. Um, but I think if I if I had a more outward Indian appearance, I think that I could also again claim that I had white and Indian ancestry, but people would constantly keep putting me back in the box of you're you're an Indian woman. You know, I think that there's sort of depending on your phenotype, that also affects how much flexibility you have in terms of ethnic identity. Um, I will also say ethnic identity and, and national pride can coexist. And, you know, I've seen it in my own family where they're proud of their Indian ancestry, but they are very proud of being American citizens. And, you know, like at the same time, like I think about my dad, who's proud of the fact that he has Indian ancestry and he was from India, but he's like, I'm an American and I'm an American first. So those things can absolutely coexist. And we certainly see that happen all the time across the United States. Um, so I think that's I think that's what I would say about that, that those two things can absolutely exist together. And I would affirm that. I mean, one of the unique cases is Native Americans didn't get the right of citizenship until 1924. One of the reasons was as a population in the US, they were unbelievably overrepresented in the military in World War One and to a large extent in World War Two. So huge pride nationally and very clear about their ethnic identity. So. I totally agree they can overlap. We're getting there. We may have time for one more question here. And I'm sorry if I don't get to everyone. If your thoughts are if your thoughts are that we will always need categories of identity on the census to address heavy discrimination and unequal outcomes, does that imply that it is not or will not be possible to eliminate racism or other systems of oppression from the human collectives? given enough time, resources, and it will be a matter of ongoing mitigation. Yeah, I'm gonna pass that to you to start. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sherwood. <laughs> so this is a tough question, and this is one that comes up a lot of my classes as well. Is this, is this are we gonna to get to a point where this is gonna get better? And I don't really have an answer for that. Um, you know, one of the things that we recently talked about in one of my classes is that, you know, as as more and more uh, people of different racial groups intermarry with each other and have mixed race children, is this going to make it better for race relations? And unfortunately, I, I can point to other societies where certainly mixing has happened and it has not, you know, gotten rid of racism. So uh, one of the places or contexts I always point to is Brazil. Brazil's had high rates of miscegenation historically, mixing historically. And what we've seen is racism still exists there, um, you know, oftentimes based on skin shade. So people with darker skin shades are more discriminated against than people with lighter, you know, skin shades. Um, so I think that 
we might see a shifting in how this looks, but I think that, you know, and I hate to say this, but I'm a little bit more of a cynical person. I just feel like humans by nature divide, you know, we like to categorize each other and divide each other. And then once we do that, it comes down to, you know, who has more power and who has the most resources in a society. My hope is that it will get better over time. Um, how long that will take, I don't know. Um, and, and my gut reaction is to think that it might change, but it'll just shift and look a little different. But those same sort of forms of oppression or maybe different forms of oppression, but it, you know, will probably continue in some in some fashion or another. Um, maybe it's not race in the future. Maybe it turns towards social class or, or something. Um, but I'll turn it over to you, Sherwood. You might have a more optimistic view, you know, I, <laughs> that, that's just my personal thought on it. Um, there's a wonderful book by a science fiction book by a woman named Ursula Le Guin called Lathe of Heaven. And um, the, there's somebody who makes everyone on earth gray as a way to try to get rid of race. And it goes to your point that all of these other things start popping out. They've gotten rid of race, but then there's all these other differences based on what part of town you're from and your class and your age and all these other things. So I don't know that, I don't need, I would hope we don't have to get rid of ethnic and cultural identity. I think we need to find ways to not stigmatize or place unwarranted values on them, right? So I don't think it's a problem with noticing that someone belongs to a particular ethnic group and or noticing that they belong to a particular age group or that they belong to a particular religious group. If in doing so, you don't automatically stereotype them into a box which they have no ability to get out of, right? Yes, I'm a flatlander from New Jersey, but it doesn't mean that everyone from New Jersey goes into a homogeneous group any, any more than everyone from the Northeast Kingdom is all the same, right? And I think that the nature, you're true, It's it's just all mammals create categories. It's not just humans. I would argue as well, just all mammals create categories. It's the weight and the meaning that we put on them that becomes really problematic, I think. You know, um, there's an interesting movie you can watch around this. It's called From Swastika to Jim Crow, where Jews escaping the Holocaust come to the U.S. Because of anti-Semitism, they can't get into American universities as faculty. So these are PhD Jewish faculty from Germany coming to the US. Because of anti-Semitic anti attitudes, they can't get into white universities. So the only universities they can get jobs in are HBCUs, historically black institutions, because at that point in time, Jews aren't seen as white, right? But then they go to the South where they're seen as white because of the phenotype and no one understands why they would be teaching at a black university. And the African-Americans don't understand why they're teaching in a black university, right? And so you've got this intersection between culture, religion, race, ethnicity, all woven together, right? And Jews are from all over the world. You know, you have Ashkenazi, right? You have multiple groups of people, Ethiopian Jews. So it is all of those things at once, but that's difficult for us to say something belongs in three categories at the same time. Um, we're, we're right at time. Um, <laughs> there's a question of whether, hey, I well, all right. Um, in honor to what we promised, I'm gonna stay with time. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions. I wanna give Nikki a chance. Do you have any closing pithy thoughts you wanna share or anything that just you that stood out for you before we close to share with the folks? Um, I think that, well, looking at the questions, I'm, I'm thankful that so many people participated um, today and I, I wish we could have gotten to all the questions. I, I think I think the main thing that's really um, stuck out for me is people's interest in the DNA ancestry test. And I think that I, I would just want to throw out there and remind people that there is a lot of controversy surrounding those tests as well. I, I know some scientists refer to them as junk science. And so I would just encourage people to do more research on them. Um, I think it's really interesting and the, the information is really interesting, but just to sort of keep in mind what it's actually telling you um, and not let it sort of reify this notion of, of, of 
racial groups as being somehow biological. And I think that's just the last thing I would want to say about that. But I've, I've really enjoyed all the questions today. This has really been fascinating. I want to say as well, thank you for everyone having put in so many great questions. I would leave people with remembering that part of this conversation has to do with the fact that language is always changing, always evolving. And so you're going to have a hard time always saying, you know, if you say what is the right term, it's always going to depend on who you're with, when and where. Language is not static and language is especially geographically limited. So the way we've talked about this is from a very US specific case. If I dropped you off in another part of the world, this conversation about language and identity and even, even the concept of race would be very different. I want to close by thanking Nikki so much for being willing to, to do all of this, to thank Paul and Masha who have helped us coordinating and doing questions. Mm -hmm. And I want to share one last slide. We really would appreciate some feedback from you if you're willing to do that. And we have one last slide here that focuses on um, where you can give us your feedback. And I would really appreciate if folks would do that for us. So if you look at this slide, if you could please send us your feedback and thoughts about the conversation, that would be really helpful and give us some ideas about going forward too. Again, thank you so much, Nikki. I've really enjoyed this. I've really enjoyed the questions people have asked. And as we start out, it's hard to be anti-racist if you don't understand race. And I hope that these two conversations we put forward have helped you to better have better questions, if nothing else, about what is race and what does it mean and how is it and being constructed and how has it been constructed? Again, thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Masha. Thank you.